Yeah, we have students uh, Anita and Drono. And uh, happy belated International Women's Day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. It was yesterday. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It was yesterday. But they called uh, uh, on March the, the month, the month of women. Yes. All uh, March belongs to us. Every month should be for us. Come on. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Well, That's know, my point. Being, you know? being, being the boy in the group, I guess I'd just like to say, my personal experience is that the world would be better off if it was run by women. <laughs> <laughs> we you know that so personally, much. yes, personally, I don't agree on a special day for women because we are equal, women and men. If we have a specific day for women, that means that we are specific. We have no, tri uh, no rights or something like that. So that uh, I don't agree on a special day for women, by the way. One, one can, I mean, one can certainly see it that way, but I, I think it's also fair to say, Doctor, that uh, women have not yet achieved the uh, equality that uh, we would hope around the world. It, it just Maybe. It simply hasn't happened yet. But a special day, it's a complete confession that <laughs> <laughs> we don't have our rights till now. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I apologize in advance if uh, I'm a little low energy, but I received yesterday my first uh, COVID shot. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not bad, a little bit of uh, topical soreness, but I, I definitely notice, um, I don't know, a, a feeling of fatigue inside the body. But uh, you know that vaccin vaccination is the uh, best way now to stop uh, our lockdown, to stop restrictions, to leave us. <laughs> the only you way. understand? Yes. I want to set, set free like before. Yes. I want to travel. I want to work as I want. Yes. It's the only solution. Yes, and in, indeed it is. In, indeed it is. And I'm, I'm happy to say in, in my country where... You know, we have a lot of people skeptical about uh, vaccines. It seems that more and more now, over seventy percent are are willing to uh, are willing to get it. So I, I think that's encouraging. Here also some calls that it will be dangerous and so on. But uh, what's harmful if I will get vaccination? It will do nothing. It will do nothing more than uh, the situation now. The situation is very dangerous. And yes. uh, everyone is afraid to, to go outside or to travel or to work. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that it's better to set free. That's what we want. More freedom. <laughs> yes, more freedom. <laughs> yes. You know that online meetings will not fulfill our desire to connect people, to connect the world. Yes. We returned back with civilization 100 years before. Yes. Yes, indeed. Okay, online is good and so on, but it's not the best way. But at least it's a solution for this bad situation. Yes, it's we can meet online. <laughs> but I want to see people. Do you understand? Yeah, of course. I want All to of interact. Us. Yes. Yeah. Even for my children. Feel. Yes, yes, indeed. Even for children. Yes, I think it's particularly difficult for children because they don't really have a context within which to, yes. to put it. They, they just know that they're deprived of the things that they used to really enjoy. And I, I think that can have a very difficult, uh, that can have a very profound impact on a generation of children. Yes. 
you know, I have uh, two daughters. Uh, my second daughter last year was at the, the last year, the last year of the high school, so that she got uh, the, the 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 degree of the high school. And this year she entered the university. It's supposed that the last year of the high school will be the la would be the last year with friends, and she lost it. And the first year of university, it should be the first year of the university to get friends, and she lost it. She yes. told me that when I will leave. Yeah. <laughs> I told her after Corona. <laughs> yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, you feel that? I feel because the, she's very young. She wants her friends and so on. It's very, it's very difficult. It's, it's very, yeah. I mean, it's difficult for everybody, but I think for younger people, it's especially difficult. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, alaikum assalam. Alaikum assalam. Hello, Rana. Hello, hello, everybody. So it, it's uh, it's four p.m. in Cairo now. It's now three in Cairo. Three p.m. Oh. in Cairo. Four p.m. in Baghdad. Uh, and two a.m. in Norway. Oh. <laughs> and and what time in Boston. Norway? What time? Two. What? Two. Yeah. Yeah, and here it's 8 a.m. I, I miscalculated. I read, I think, 4 p.m. Baghdad. I thought Baghdad was like Jordan. So apparently it's not. That was my mistake. <laughs> no, I think we're one hour ahead of you. Yeah, that's yeah. why. All right, so I apologize for being late a couple of minutes. Um, what's, the, what's the sequence? Who's going to start for 15 minutes each? Or what's the 15 format? minutes each. Uh, at first, uh, Dr. Peter or Mr. Peter, because he is the only guy here. <laughs> I'm happy then, to last. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. But uh, I arranged it like that because I, um, I consider Rana and Nindat uh, Iqbal as success stories. So that I want them to follow each other. And at first, the two organizations. That's the way. <clears throat> We are now live on Facebook, if you want to share the link. Okay. The link is in the chat. The link on Facebook, if you want to, on mm -hmm. the chat. Yeah, would it be possible to share the link on the chat, please? Yeah, okay. Professor Ekbal, has the sun gone down in Norway? Yeah, but it's like <laughs> picture. It's like picture. It's still cold. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed, could you please share the link of Facebook in the chat? Because I couldn't open. <coughs> Can you hear? Okay. I need that. I don't hear you. Please go inside. Can you hear me? No. I need that. I didn't. I don't hear you. I need that. I think uh, some, someone has already shared the link. Someone yeah. shared the link. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Ola, Dr. Ola shared uh -huh. the link. Thank you. Dr. Ola from Indonesia. Aninda, Dr. Ahmed, Aninda said that uh, she couldn't uh, be heard. Who, oh, sorry? Dr. Aninda, the, the fourth journalist, Anindita from India. So what's her problem? The voice. She couldn't join us with voice. Uh, she will rejoin. Okay. I, I must say, being somewhat older, I've I've uh, I've come to learn a lot about the electronic world in in, <laughs> in the last year. <laughs> it's nice. It's advantage. Uh, it by really, the way. I mean, it's. I, I remember when I started working with UNHCR in West Africa in 2001, and we had uh, Telex, 
uh, and we had satellite phones, which didn't work, and we had the mail. I mean, this is how we communicated, <laughs> like actual post, real letters, postcards, that sort of thing. It's, uh, it's, it's quite incredible, the changes over the last couple of decades. Last year, I think I, uh, I, do it, I did it better, yeah. I think I did it better because I read a lot. I uh, wrote uh, my thesis. I think I did a lot of things. Well, that's something to be said for having extra time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> extra in, time. In lockdown. Yes. <laughs> The, the UN has actually uh, imposed a, a new lockdown in Iraq uh, until the 18th of March uh, because Jeez. of the, yes. the, the, uh, the rising numbers, even though government Indeed. has not. Really? Yeah, yeah. we are uh, inside the compound, can't get out. <laughs> Just really? You <laughs> have lockdown? Enjoying, uh, yeah, we are in the lockdown until the 18th. And I, I don't want to get too tribal about it, uh, Salwa, but you know, We've always had an ability to move around and, and be operational more in KRI than in Center South. Um, and sometimes we get a little annoyed with you Baghdad people. <laughs> That's not fair. I lived in KRI for two years, so I can tell definitely the, the, the easy, easy movement in KRI between the governorates, uh, especially for for internationals, um, it's it's much easier to be able to go to the field and, and yep. explore. And unfortunately, we don't have this um, you know this this added value in, in, in Baghdad. Yep. It's a little bit more challenging to move around. Yeah, yep. no lockdown. So, but here we stopped lockdown maybe one year ago. Uh, but uh, they ask people to have masks on their faces and so on, and uh, the schools. Uh, maybe closed uh, for one or two months, and that's all. Mm. Because we had economic problems when we made the lockdown. Yes. It was a disaster, really. It was really a, a devil's choice. Yeah. Um, what they say, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah. So just wondering if the lady from India has joined us again or not? Yes, I have joined. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 yes, hello. Hello, <laughs> how are you? Good, good. Good afternoon, Aninda. Good evening from India. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good evening. Okay, five minutes and we will start. Okay. Shall I start, Dr. Ahmed? Okay. Yes, if you are ready, please. Okay. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome you all at afternoon session uh, in plenary session four, before, uh, under the title Science for Humanity, we will have uh, two hours with great speakers and mixture between two uh, UN bodies and three great female scientists. First, I will give uh, each uh, speaker the chance to give a short talk for 15 minutes, then questions and discussions will be at the end of the session. The session will be moderated by, uh, the discussion session will be at the end, uh, moderated by uh, Professor Aninda Bhadra from India. The first speaker is uh, Mr. Peter Truter. Mr. Peter Truter, uh, Truter has served with UNHCR since uh, 2001 in a range uh, of protection functions with an emphasis on complex and emergency operations. Mr. Truter is currently the UNHCR head of sub-office, the Hope, and has previously served in Lebanon, uh, Thailand, South Sudan, and uh, ABI administrative area, Zimbabwe, and other countries. Uh, Mr. Truter practiced law for 20 years in Boston 
uh, with an emphasis on civil uh, litigation. Uh, Mr. Truter received his Bachelor of Arts from Simmons uh, Rock Early College. Uh, his lecture will be about the criticality of education in displacement as both an indiv individual protection and uh, community support intervention. The floor is yours, uh, to, uh, Mr. Truter, for 15 minutes. Thank, thank you so much. And I, I have to confess, I, I feel a bit intimidated being really a simple country lawyer and uh, a humanitarian field worker in a, in a group of uh, uh, such uh, renowned uh, academics and, and scholars. Um, and as I, I mentioned to a couple of the colleagues earlier, I'm, I'm, I've just had my first COVID vaccine shot and, and I'm feeling oh, just a little uh, feverish. So if I'm a bit slow, uh, forgive me. Um, but I, I'd like to start with, with profound thanks to the organizers of, of this, this truly important forum and, and the august body of scholars and practitioners that are, are represented. You know, in a, a world where science and facts are under increasing attack and where much progress has been made in mainstreaming support that takes into account the specific needs based on age, gender, and other diversity profiles, but where much remains to be achieved, this is really a welcome initiative and one we hope that's continued, magnified, and, and replicated, uh, uh, both through the Women in Science Forum and, and otherwise. UNHCR really appreciates the opportunity to highlight the unique challenges faced and opportunities arising for persons displaced by persecution and conflict. Displacement, which unfortunately continues to rise around the world. Um, we, we were talking a bit uh, in the margins about the COVID situation and, and certainly the COVID situation has neg negatively impacted many aspects of our daily personal and, and civic lives, but it's particularly disrupted education. And imagine, if you will, compounding of these challenges if you're a refugee or an internally displaced person, often forced to leave behind everything, resources, income, family, friends, community, and struggling to rebuild and maintain some sense of normalcy in an unfamiliar place. I, I mean, that said, the COVID situation also underscores the overall criticality of education, and it's had a positive change in terms of perceptions and adaptive technology. Uh, th uh, this uh, th this workshop is is an example, but of course, remote learning and and e learning uh, has uh, increased in prominence, uh, and and that has, uh, while it has its challenges, it's it's certainly uh, enhanced uh, uh, access to uh, education, and 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 I think the COVID situation globally is 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 helping to crystallize in the minds of ordinary people uh, uh, the importance of education given the, the, the relative absence of, of education over, over the last years. Um, from UNHCR's perspective, education is a basic human right. It's enshrined in the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child and in particular in the 1951 Refugee Convention. Education protects refugee children and youth from forced recruitment into armed groups, from child labor, sexual exploitation, and child marriage. Education also strengthens the resilience of, of communities and empowers refugees by giving them knowledge and skills to live productive and fulfilled and independent lives. At the same time, it enlightens refugees and people hosting refugees and enables them to learn about themselves and each other. Uh, uh, and I think of, of particular importance and, and relevance to uh, this seminar, education and access to education really shows uh, how uh, uh, re refugees and, and persons in displacement uh, can not only through education support their own betterment, uh, but, but really contribute to the communities that are, are providing them protection in, in exile. And for 70 years, the UNHCR has been uh, uh, mandated to provide protection. Uh, and that's been 70 years of, of learning. Uh, and over those 70 years, and, and with two Nobel Peace Prizes to, uh, uh, to its credit, UNHCR and its partners have been mandated to, uh, to support governments in providing protection and solutions uh, for displaced persons, as well as support in displacement. 
UNHCR, I think most of you know, was born out of the horrors of World War II uh, and a resolve to secure the most basic human rights. Uh, and in these regards, the 1951 convention, although for purposes of this workshop, not ratified by uh, the Iraqi government in, 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 pract in principle, um, <clears throat> Uh, Article 22 of the, the Refugee Convention clearly advocates for inclusion of refugees in public education systems. When the convention was first drafted, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that the perspective was, was very European. Uh, in fact, originally and not until the 1967 protocol, the, the, uh, uh, the definitions and protections uh, in the, the Refugee Convention were limited to the situation arising in, in, in Europe uh, before, during, and, and after World War II. In 1967, the General Assembly uh, uh, expanded UNHCR's mandate, uh, and the, 60, the 1967 uh, Refugee Protocol uh, made, made the 51 Convention uh, applicable uh, throughout the throughout the world, not just limited to displacement arising on the, the European continent. And it's now one of the most widely ratified uh, human rights conventions with 149 countries uh, having signed up to it. Um, in addition, of course, in, in 1950, UNHCR was created. It was not created by the, the Refugee Convention. And, and stands apart in that way. But UNHCR was created in 1950 uh, by unanimous resolution of the General Assembly. Um, and I, I think something, uh, something to keep in mind in terms of uh, global powers understanding the challenges posed by uh, displacement, UNHCR's High Commissioner is the only uh, uh, United Nations uh, 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 leadership position other than that of the Secretary General, which is actually elected by uh, the General Assembly. And I, I think that, that, that underscores what, what we hope is a continuing appreciation on the part of uh, member states of the United Nations, the uh, importance of, of uh, securing protections for, uh, for persons in, in displacement. Um, progress on meeting education uh, needs in the context of displacement has been slow. Uh, admittedly, uh, there are uh, gaps and, and absences. And uh, as I mentioned briefly, in the 51 Convention, Article 22, it mer merely makes reference to access to public education uh, under conditions not less favorable than those uh, applicable to foreigners generally. That's a bit of uh, legalese, but, but it basically says, yeah, you can have access to our education, but just like any other foreign person uh, in, uh, in our country. Um, similar, uh, by the way, with respect to Article 19 and the recognition of uh, degrees and, and liberal professions to, to allow uh, professionals to have their degrees earned in their home countries, recognized in, in, uh, in their countries of asylum. As we sit here today, there are about 90 million displaced people in the world, uh, about 20 million of whom are refugees outside of their home countries and uh, who've been forced to flee persecution on the basis of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. That, that, that fifth uh, category would include, for example, uh, people with an LGBTI uh, profile marginalized minority communities that might not fall within the definitions of race or religion. And indeed, I, I recall many years ago, uh, Hillary Clinton suggesting that, uh, uh, that uh, women, at least in certain displacement contexts, uh, could simply by uh, status of their gender uh, be considered refugees because of the uh, severe degrees of uh, uh, persecution uh, they've experienced, for example, women in Afghanistan. Um, in addition to uh, these, these uh, uh, five grounds uh, for uh, uh, recognizing uh, uh, persecution and therefore falling within 
uh, the definition of the 1951 convention, um, the, the, the mandate of UNHCR was, was expanded by the General Assembly to include uh, providing support to people who have fled generalized violence and insecurity. That would, that would be you know, largely in the context, for example, of uh, uh, civil wars and touches on the more complicated question of, of internal displacement, people who are displaced within uh, the borders of, uh, of their home country. Despite the hopes at the end of the Cold War, and I, I remember those as a, a student very well, the trend of rising internal and cross-border uh, uh, conflict has led to increasing displacement, basically an increase of around 7 to 10 million individuals a year uh, with solutions for, for uh, uh, permanent solutions for, <coughs> excuse me, for uh, uh, very few of them. And I think another phenomenon that uh, we've seen over the last several decades is the increasingly protracted nature uh, of uh, displacement. You know, it used to be that uh, uh, maybe uh, you might be displaced for six months or, or a year and there, of course, the impact on your life and, and for purposes of this workshop on, on education were certainly severe, but uh, imagine, if you will, if you've been displaced for uh, 10 years or 15 years or two generations, uh, uh, as it were. Um, and uh, that's so that in increasingly protracted nature uh, of displacement uh, has led to increasing disruptions in, in, uh, uh, in, in education uh, and uh, uh, something I hope that we can all continue to uh, work to, uh, to improve. Now, among the 20 million refugees worldwide today, uh, about 40% are girls and boys. And while 77% are enrolled in primary school, that's, that's quite a, a good success. Some of those are uh, government schools, some of those are private schools, some of those are uh, schools set up by humanitarian actors like uh, UNHCR or uh, other non-governmental organizations. Um, only about 31% are enrolled in secondary schools and less than 3% are enrolled in higher education. And sadly, girls are particularly underrepresented with about only 20% of those in, enrolled in, in uh, secondary education. I, I'm, I'm reminded of a time when I was working in South Sudan during the civil war that, that followed uh, independence in, in 2012 and 2013, when I came to learn that uh, in that context, and of course it's different in, in the Middle East and, and in other parts of the world, but in that context, it was more likely that a young woman was going to die in childbirth than that she was to achieve a fourth grade education. And while we're talking here, uh, you know, uh, of uh, advanced learning of, of, of science and, and, uh, and, and higher education, I think it's always important to, to keep in mind that these scholars come from somewhere. So uh, for UNHCR and our current strategy that goes through 2030, uh, while we hope to increase the numbers of refugees in tertiary education- Mr. Vitor, one minute. Yes, one minute. Around, yeah, one minute, around, please. Yes, okay, to around 15%, uh, it's going to be a tough road. Um, there is a program that I'd like to highlight, and that's the Daffy Scholarship Program, which is the Albert Einstein German Academic Refugee Initiative. You see Albert Einstein on a, a UNHCR poster behind me, and that's a scholarship program for qualified refugees and refugee returnee students to earn an undergraduate degree in their country of asylum or in their uh, country of return. Um, this program has a, a remarkable history in, uh, in Iraq and in particular in, in KRI. And here I'd just like to say a quick uh, word of appreciation to uh, our government counterparts in, in uh, Kurdistan, uh, because notwithstanding that Iraq is not a party to, a, to the 51 convention, uh, the, uh, uh, the KRG has, has really supported uh, all of the critical elements of the 1951 convention, including access to asylum uh, and uh, access to education. Um, there are challenges, uh, language challenges, uh, curriculum challenges, recognition of degree challenges, but uh, what we find is most important is with uh, academics, with government uh, counterparts, 
uh, these challenges, uh, as long as there's goodwill, uh, can be worked uh, can be worked through. Uh, in in Iraq, we've been uh, working with the DAFI program for uh, uh, for about the last ten years, uh, and uh, approximately uh, 275 students, including 160 women, uh, have uh, benefited with education at 17 universities. Uh, throughout uh, 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 throughout uh, the country, and of these scholars, 60% were women. Were hosted in Dohuk universities. Um, so a shout out to uh, uh, to our colleagues in uh, uh, in Dohuk. Um, and I would just like to highlight, in terms of the impact on uh, protection, two uh, Dafi scholars who are Syrian refugees, Nergiz uh, and uh, uh, Ava. Uh, Nergiz uh, is uh, one of the top students, a uh, Syrian refugee, and one of the top students at the College of Medicine in Dohuk University. She's currently working on uh, a paper involving uh, uh, the adverse effects of smoking, says a smoker, uh, on uh, DNA. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Ava, uh, who's also a Daffy scholar, uh, is working Mr. on... Mr. Uh, yes, time, time. Two, 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 two more minutes is working okay. on, uh, is working on uh, an educational software at the College of Science and Computer Science in, in Dohuk uh, to ease the processes of enrollment and record keeping uh, in the academic context. And I think these two uh, uh, exceptional women uh, demonstrate not only the importance of education for their own protection, but for the contributions that they can make uh, to uh, the communities supporting them in displacement. Uh, and uh, I would urge all of you uh, in uh, your different academic environments to uh, take a breath and uh, think from time to time about uh, how it is uh, we can help people who are in displacement uh, further their educations uh, or how it is we can support those people who have been displaced and returned home. Uh, support their education. And uh, if you'd like any further information about how you can contribute to that, please feel free to reach out to me directly and I'll, I'll be more than happy to uh, point you in the right direction. Thank you very much for this time. Uh, I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot. And, uh, happy to answer any questions uh, at the appropriate time. The questions and discussion will be at the end. Stay with us. Yes. Uh, thanks for your nice lecture. Uh, really, you raise uh, some issues that uh, there are still big numbers of refugees and displaced people and bad situation. It's really shame on the world and setback for the global civilization. We have uh, to solve this problem, Mr. Yes, Beaton. Yes, okay, indeed. we will transfer to the next speaker. Uh, Ms. Salwa Musa is a Lebanese uh, national serving as a communications specialist for the United Nations a population fund in Iraq. Mrs. Musa has more than 10 years experience in the area of communications, journalism, and advocacy. She worked in governmental institutions, non-governmental sector. She is particularly passionate about women's rights and gender equality, especially in humanitarian settings. In addition to her rule in Iraq, Mrs. Musa has recently supported a response in Ethiopia, working in camps and hard to reach uh, areas, highlighting uh, the plight of uh, women and girls. I think we found uh, the right person. Throughout <laughs> her career, she organized several advocacy campaigns for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for uh, Palestine refugees in the Near East in Lebanon. And Syria, she worked on donor relations and documented the humanitarian crisis in Syria. Her lecture will be transforming the girls' lives through science. The floor is yours, Ms. Salwa, for 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Professor. And uh, please um, I say it's my honor to be here to represent the United Nations Population Fund UNFPA in Iraq. Uh, we are really pleased to be able to have this platform to share uh, our thoughts, our program, especially those related to young girls and the impact that, uh, you know, science can have on their lives and helping them to reach their full potential. 
I have a little a short presentation that I have prepared uh, for uh, you guys. So if you allow me to share the presentation. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Go yes. ahead, please. Uh, yes. Thank you. All right. So on the 22nd of December 2015, and that is about six years ago, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution announcing the establishment of the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, and that is on the 11th of February. Now, this signals the interest of the international community in achieving equality and gender parity in science for sustainable development, and it recognizes that full access and participation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics subjects is imperative for the empowerment of women and girls uh, and for achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030. Now, um, so the contrary to the stereotypes and the propaganda that we have, women in science, the Arab world, are actually testing that men. They are uh, not really intimidated to say that they like science-based uh, subjects. Um, however, despite facing stark inequality, women in the Middle East achieve more science and math degrees per capita uh, than their counterpart, for example, in the United States or Europe. And in fact, up to 57% of all STEM graduates in the Arab countries are women. And that is, this data is according to the UNESCO report in 2019. Now, this success has not successfully uh, translated into the job market, unfortunately. Many women are instead staying at home, uh, whether from choice or because of cultural, social, or familiar pressures. Um, in fact, 13 of 15 uh, countries with the lowest rate of female participation in the workforce are in the Arab world, and that is according to the World Bank. Um, but why are women really facing so many challenges? Let's just dig a little deeper into this. Um, these points are really intertwined, uh, and when we solve them, one another, the puzzle starts coming in. So first, uh, it's gender stereotypes. The role of women in our communities uh, are really questioned. Women are expected to play a secondary role, uh, to have the role of the caregiver, uh, maybe the mother, the sister, uh, always to take care of everyone, to follow what is dictated for her, and they're really only placed in the box of, of motherhood or um, instead of being seen as, as women in the workforce. They are more seen as women working from home only, not given the opportunity to play both roles, that is perhaps a motherhood or, or partner, but also to play the role of leader in her community and society. And it's unfortunate that we have, but we have to admit that we live in a male dominated culture. Uh, and, and in our culture, men are seen as the more reliable ones, and they are the ones able to handle more responsibility. Uh, they are seen as the decision makers, and women are not really given, again, that opportunity to, to shine. But uh, experience has shown that um, throughout the different decades that women are as capable, women are as strong as men, and women are fierce leaders. Um, for young girls especially, there are very few role models that they can follow. Uh, that they can inspire them and, and get their interest in these fields. Uh, seeing limited examples of female scientists or engineers in book, in the media, in, in, in popular cultures, in the different um, aspects of, of girls' lives uh, is disencouraging girls and is really hiding and limiting their abilities to think further of different options in life than those that are given to them by, by adults. The lack of awareness of these girls, and this might come surprising, uh, the lack of awareness on girls' rights uh, to education and development. Uh, we take our rights for granted sometimes as, as women, and we think that all women and girls, uh, they are aware of their entitlements and rights in life, uh, but they don't. Uh, through my various field visits, whether in Iraq or Ethiopia or Syria or Jordan or even Lebanon, um, women do not necessarily know what their rights are. They don't know they have the right to education and that is one of the most important rights that they have. They don't know they have the right to financial independence. They don't know they have the right to choose. And, and this limits their, their abilities uh, into um, 
uh, paving their own way into into thinking of what they want, their careers. They, they don't really know that they have the right to have a voice, an opinion, to be able to learn, to, to say no, to say that I want to learn to read and write. And I remember I was so impressed by a young woman in Anbar uh, in one of my visits where she came to me and she said, my father wants to marry me off. And I think she was 15 or 14. And she said, but I want to learn. I want to study, I want to be a scientist. And that girl really inspires me every day because I feel like we have the duty to, to, to increase this awareness. And I know a lot of people say, but what does awareness do? But awareness does a lot. And we really need to increase uh, girls' knowledge and education to, for them to know what they are capable of, to give them that opportunity to decide what they want to be in life. The lack of family planning and the family planning awareness um, you may ask what's the relationship between family planning and girls' development, but uh, the more families have the opportunities to plan their childbirth and the child spacing, the more they can plan their children's future and less resort to the harmful practices like child marriage. And child marriage means that, you know, girls are deprived from their education and they are given bigger roles than they are really capable of, of handling. The lack of family planning often leads, if, if not always really, the lack of family planning leads to an increase of unwanted pregnancies, especially among adolescent girls. Their bodies are not ready for childbearing and that causes avoidable uh, maternal death. And that means that we are limiting them from reaching their full potential. Um, another point of, of uh, why women are facing so many challenges and, and girls in particular, is the harmful practices because whenever they occur, uh, harmful practices rob girls from their childhood and they deny them the chance to determine their own future and they threaten their well-being as individual, as families and their societies as well. So these are the major challenges that, that really girls face and we're really open at the end of, of this session, as, as Professor Amal said, to hear what, what everyone also thinks about the challenges and how we can all over, overcome them. Um, but let me give you some of what we've experienced at, at, uh, at Turin FBA and what I've experienced personally uh, to be some sort of a solution to reduce this gap because this gap is there. Um, one of the most important things, as I've mentioned earlier, is raising awareness at a very early age, promoting the participation of women and girls in science, technology, engineering, and math, as well as sexual productive health and women's rights, means we are changing their mindset, means we are fighting gender stereotypes and biases. That, 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 that these gender, uh, these, these um, stereotypes and biases are limiting the girls' horizons and expectations and professional goals since their early childhood. So we are really not giving them that chance to shine. And it's as simple as that. So the more they are informed and encouraged, the more that these girls can dream and can excel. Encouraging, uh, encouraging sorry, young girls in particular in, in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. And the more we challenge them to undertake tasks and paths that are usually caught for, for men in our society, it helps them gain confidence. And with confidence, they say when a woman wears her confidence, she's at her best. And that's absolutely true. And we have to create more opportunities for girls to increase their knowledge and their skills in the different forms, for example, the different fields uh, like the ICT, like giving them the opportunities to, to compete, for example, in math and science competitions. Let's not just think about, um, you know, drawing or painting, which are also very important, but let's get girls more involved in more uh, science related fields, which is also the topic of our discussion today. Um, if we want to talk about the work, the workforce and the workplace and why women are taking, are not able to reach the, the, the full potential there, uh, to be honest, what we've noticed mostly, uh, and I can see also from, from my colleagues, you know, uh, what we need to create uh, the right environment for women to strive. Um, for example, if we talk about mothers, mothers have kids and they need to have a good uh, childcare system. We need to be open and flexible with women because they are wearing two hats. They are wearing the leader, they are wearing the, 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 the cap of the, the woman uh, who is a hard worker, but they are also wearing uh, 
um, the, the camp of the woman who is raising children, who is creating life, who is creating and helping build with her husband as a family, a new generation. So we really need to make sure that we understand the needs of, of women and, and girls, young girls who are also, you know, studying, but also working. We need to be flexible in understanding these challenges. Uh, mentorship programs are also very important. Uh, girls need to have mentorship programs at an early age, and most important of all, giving them that opportunity uh, of leadership again with tasks, with internships. Let's let's teach them. Let's have successful women help other women. Let's have successful men showing women that they can succeed. And um, finally, one of the things that we have noticed, and that I can tell, especially in the in the Kurdistan region. Women are overcoming, you know, the obstacles that we mentioned earlier by launching their own startups uh, from home. They are leveraging the internet, especially in my COVID-19, and they are engaging through online platforms to reach new markets. Uh, in fact, one in three startups uh, in the Arab world are founded and led by women. And as I mentioned, I noticed in the Kurdistan region that um, we have a lot of startup women and women are supporting one another and they're encouraging one another and they are sharing. We need to do that more across the, the Arab region, across the world, uh, because if we don't you know, take care of one another, we cannot expect others to do it. Uh, and I want to show you just a few women who have uh, succeeded in in science, uh, technology, uh, uh, you know, uh, engineering and mathematics fields. We have um, Diana Asindi, who's an Iraqi American uh, propulsion development engineer at Virgin Orbit. Uh, Zaha Hadid, of course, she's the British Iraqi architect, artist and designer. She's the world renowned figure in the architecture of the late 20th and early 21st centuries. Uh, Dr. Suman Hardy, uh, a contemporary Kurdish academ uh, academ academian, apologies, researcher, poet, translator, and painter. Uh, Lama Al-Babdi, she's Saudi, she's a researcher on chromatin and regulation of the gene uh, vision loss project. Uh, Ms. Asrar Damdam, she's a Saudi researcher on the design and fabrication of the heart assistive device, the heart sleeve, and Ms. Maryam Tarek Khalil Al Hashimi. She's a Marathi and she's a researcher on engineered uh, catalytic materials for sustainable production of chemicals. I mean, we should have more, we should highlight all of us together more successful women. I mean, these are just six of, of many more women that. Uh, while I was doing my you know, research, while we were basing our programs that inspire us every day. And these women um, should be the example for the younger generation, for the new generation. We should have more openness to young girls, showing them what they can become if they have the proper support. And it's our responsibility to give that support to them. As UNFPA, um, our goal, as I mentioned, um, uh, earlier, I mentioned earlier, is to attain universal access to sexual and productive health rights for all through three transformative results. The first one is to end the unmet need for family planning. The second one is to end maternal death. And the third one is to end violent and harmful practices against women and girls. And if you remember what I said earlier about the challenges and the solutions, and this is what UNFPA is about. We aim to help girls. We aim to give them support. We aim to help them to reach their full potential. But if the three transformative results are not met, this will remain a big challenge. So that's why we are tailoring all our programs in Iraq and across the world to help young women, to get them to explore in life. And some of the things that we are doing uh, most recently is for example, in the, in the field of science and technology. Um, and by the end of 2020, so last year, we established computer labs in 10 youth centers across Europe, and we're offering young girls and women the opportunities to strengthen their computer skills. And as a follow-up, uh, we are planning to develop a computer-based entertainment program on sexual and reproductive health for girls, but also for boys. Uh, the program will provide them access to verified information on sexual reproductive health rights, and uh, will provide them with the knowledge to enable them to make informed choices uh, that are related to their bodies, to their lives, to their careers. Now, one of the areas where UNFPA works on empowering young girls to achieve their goals and reach their full potential is through the creation of an enabling environment through 
policies and legislation. And here I would like to really thank our partners, uh, the Iraqi federal government and the government of um, the Kurdistan region uh, for giving us the opportunity to be to, to being solid partners and putting young girls and, and women's uh, rights first. They have been a big shift in, in how we are perceiving girls and in, in girls program oriented. Um, so UNFPA will develop an employability framework and design livelihood per programs on software development, IT and engineering, targeting young girls and, and women. And these will be done uh, with uh, two minutes uh, left. Two minutes left. I need one. Uh, through our partners. Two minutes left, Mrs. Salwa. Yes. All right. Um, so uh, this will be done through our partners, uh, the civil society, uh, through our partners at the government. And um, we also have supported uh, you know, the, the Youth Peace and Security Coalition, where we have given, or we've offered, we offered a platform for young girls uh, to speak up, to be part of, uh, of, um, of the decision-making process. We have also supported advisory board, youth advisory board, where young girls can speak up, can be part of shaping their own futures and their communities. And finally, we will continue to provide access to essential package of services that is aimed towards shifting the social and gender norms through community-driven efforts that are critical in accelerating the elimination of harmful practices. We have 70 women's centers where adolescent girls can come, can get sessions, can learn more about their bodies, their opportunities, and women can also uh, talk about the challenges they're facing. Um, we owe to women and girls to give them a platform to thrive and we will continue to do so. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, on behalf of, of UNFPA in Iraq, I want to say thank you so much for listening to me. We are, of course, open for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Salwa, for uh, this nice talk. <clears throat> uh, really, you raised a very important uh, questions and very important subjects. Why are women facing so many challenges? It's a big subject. It needs more uh, lectures, me needs continuous uh, explanation, depending on different factors. So we'll keep the uh, discussions at the end. And now we will transfer to the, uh, to the other part of our session today, which is divided into two uh, sessions or into two sections. The first section, uh, belongs to UN bodies and so on. Then the second one uh, will be about success stories and life stories of great female scientists from different countries, uh, where our first speaker for that part will be Professor Rana Dajani from Jordan. Her lecture will be about terror and hope, the science of resilience. Uh, professor Rana Dajani is a professor at Hashemia University in Jordan and currently a fellow at uh, the Gibson School of Leadership at the University of Reichman. She is the founder of the famous global educational program, Wheel of Reading. Uh, she is founder of mentorship program, Three Circles of Alimat. She is a recipient of many national and international awards. She is a member of many international and national organizations. She is prominent scientist, good mother for four kids, leader and social entrepreneur. She is also the author of the book Five Scarves, Doing the Impossible, If We Can Reserve uh, Self-Faith. Why can't we redefine success? Okay, the floor is yours, Rana, for 15 minutes. Thank you we very can't much. can't hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you for inviting me uh, to be part of this panel and to share my experience uh, of my research and what, um, what we can do as scientists in, within our communities and within our societies. Um, hopefully you can see my PowerPoint and we will begin the slideshow. All right, so uh, the, the title of my talk is Terror and Hope. And actually we will see why I gave it that, that title. It's the title of a movie that was recently nominated for, uh, for the Academy Awards as a documentary on science of resilience and how scientists uh, have a very important role in helping humanity 
in terms of atrocities, but also in terms of programming that can make a difference in the lives of, of children and refugees. Uh, and I'm going to speak about the Syrian crisis because, uh, uh, as Amal mentioned, I'm half Palestinian from Jerusalem and half Syrian from Aleppo, and I'm a citizen of Jordan. And as all scientists, what we do is we see what everybody sees, but we think what nobody has thought. Uh, that's the hallmark of being a scientist and the hallmark of being human and why we survived as a species. So when the Syrian crisis spilled over into Jordan in 2011, within many, the majority of the children, as was mentioned earlier in terms of statistics, were children and children out of school uh, and children, especially now with COVID, going through a lot of uh, challenges, most importantly, mental health because of the impact of the war, the trauma and the displacement. Uh, it became imperative that we try to help alleviate that stress. Many programs uh, focus on providing food and shelter and basic health, but there are other uh, needs for these children and their families which relate to their mental health. And so a number of programs were rolled out by international organizations among uh, uh, refugees. Uh, one of them was called the No Lost Generation program run by Mercy Corps. It was an eight-week program trying to alleviate stress and boost resilience as they had uh, claimed in their objectives. Uh, and, uh, and so, of course, uh, the word, I mean, we are, keep using the word refugees when to me we need to use a better word for us, uh, especially in the Arab region. I'm sure it's the same in neighboring countries all around the world. Uh, these boundaries that were set by, uh, by um, col colonizers are artificial boundaries and actually the, the children and the families that come across the border because of war are actually friends and family. And, and in Jordan, that's how, we, that's how we felt. People coming from Iraq, from Palestine, from Syria, these are all friends and family. And then the word refugee, unfortunately, was uh, placed onto them when international organizations came in with all good intention to help. Uh, but gave, gave them that name and suddenly overnight the refugee became the other group. So we need to be very careful what words we use and what terms we use uh, as we address these issues because it frames how we think and perceive the people around us. So the, the research that we did to evaluate this program had three very important uh, innovations. One of them is that there was an independence of teams. So it wasn't just a group of scientists studying uh, what the program and its impact on the children. It was a, it was a co consortium of experts from around the world from different universities, not just Western or Global North, but actually uh, we as uh, from the Hashemite University and Tahrir Foundation were the ones who were responsible for doing the research on the ground in Jordan, contributing equally in terms of power dynamics on the design of the research, the tools that were used, the analysis of the results, uh, and then disseminating it back into the communities wh which were studied, which is in this case with the refugees. This is a very important lesson. First, the independence, that it's not the implementer who's doing the study, but a third neutral party, and then the involvement of local scientists and those from Syria and Jordanian um, uh, origin. Uh, the second innovation was doing a randomized control trial in a, with an ethical lens. And so what we did is we, 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 after we gathered the families, we asked their permission to do the research, uh, the child had to pick a lollipop from a bag randomly, and then the color of the lollipop was randomly assigned every night differently to assign a group to be in the random uh, group or in the experimental group. And then those who were in the control group um, uh, were given the, the uh, intervention after we finished the study uh, to, so that they would benefit as well. Uh, the, we had uh, a number of, we compared Syrian refugees with Jordanians from the same vulnerable lower socioeconomic status in four different areas in Jordan. And we looked at four things. We looked at their psychosocial status, biomarkers, cognitive function, and genetics to, to really draw a picture of what's happening and to really understand how this program works, if it does. Um, and so the first one was using these self-reports at three time points. And, and these are some of the results from the different uh, surveys we had used. And we saw, as in any good research, some of the uh, indicators improved and some of them did not. And that's very important because not any program could actually target everything at the same time. But also importantly, we learned uh, that as the children were taking these self-reports, they were feeling bad because a lot of them were negative. And so this was the research team in Jordan, the Syrians and the Jordanians, who said, can't we develop a tool that is more positive so that the children will go home on a more positive tone? And that's why we adapted as a team uh, a resilience tool to measure their resilience. We're able to show for this particular program that the resilience was not improved. And that was a very important lesson 
is that although the program was designed in the, with the objective of mind of improving resilience, it didn't. Uh, and the reason was, is that resilience in our communities and cultures, the Arab communities and cultures, is about family and community. While the, re the whole program was designed uh, by the West, by Westerners, who to them, the image of resilience is more based on the individual. This is an important lesson that, that any program design should be done on the ground with the people, led by the people who are themselves the beneficiaries to start with, because they know better what the root causes are and therefore what are the more sustainable and, and uh, programs that would develop on the objective. Uh, and so as a result, now they're redesigning their program to include family members and communities in order to deliver on the resilience. Uh, we published our results, of course, uh, and uh, uh, science ran a whole uh, article about the resilience tool that we developed and how we were measuring resilience in these children. And again, putting a positive lens rather than a negative lens on things. Uh, then we went on to study cognition to see what is the impact of war and displacement on cognition using computer games. And surprisingly, we found that uh, the biggest and important factor that impacted cognition was not the war and displacement, but the poverty. Uh, and this is an important message for, for UN and, and for governments uh, to really uh, uh, pinpoint and focus on poverty and providing opportunities for young people in order to help improve their cognition. Uh, the third uh, outcome that we measured was looking at biomarkers because, you know, your body doesn't lie. And, and so if you look under the skin and try to understand what's happening, we can help better these, the, the, the children. So we looked at um, inflammation and cortisol, right? Uh, we looked at uh, CRP for inflammation and we looked at EBV which, uh, for cell-mediated immune function because we know that the immune system actually is an indicator of how stressed you are. However, we were not able to find any uh, uh, impact uh, on the immune system in our particular sample with this particular program. Uh, and so we looked at cortisol. We know cortisol is a stress hormone and you, you secrete it when you're stressed. And if your stress is less, it decreases. It has its own trajectory uh, depending on the intensity of the stress and the trauma. And we, so we took hair samples in addition to the blood uh, to look at cortisol. And this was kind of fun because the kids got a, a free haircut. And this free haircut kind of approach was also an idea from the Syrian refugees themselves saying uh, that we can do this, this is fun. And at the same time, we can learn about science and how cool science is. Uh, and we were able to show for this program that the cortisol levels actually went down as a result of the intervention. And we shared these results back with the community, which most scientists don't. They just publish and they, know they don't go back to the research community itself, the children that they evaluated or the families or adults and share with them what happened so that the child can see the importance of science and evidence in developing better programming. And most importantly, it gives them agency that they have a control over their lives. They're not just victims waiting for some international organization or government to come and save them, that they have some ownership on their future and can develop their own um, uh, solutions. So this is the research team that worked on with us on evaluating the Mercy Corps program. But science doesn't stop here. You know, the, when you answer a question, 10 more questions come up. So we were now interested to look at epigenetics. And what is epigenetics? It's the impact of the environment on your genetic material. Not that it changes the sequence of your DNA, but it impacts how it is expressed, uh, how cells deal with trauma. So we already know from mice that if a mouse is being taken care of by a mother, uh, a, a, in a high nurturing mother, the mouse will grow up to be a relaxed adult. But if a pup is carried for by a low nurturing mother, the pup will grow up to be an anxious adult. And we know that this is reversible because it's just making changes on the DNA uh, as an impact of the environment. And so we wanted to uh, see and study the cortisol response, which I mentioned is an indicator of stress, because we know that the cortisol receptor in your brain uh, reduces the level of cortisol uh, to bring it back down to normal after you're being stressed. And we know that epigenetics, the, the impact of the environment, can affect the expression of this receptor, meaning making it more or less. And we know that this is being uh, growing up as an anxious mouse, if their mother is low nurturing, has an evolutionary advantage because now you're more alert to your environment to protect yourself. And so, and we know that these studies are also reflected in humans, although we couldn't do the same scientists couldn't do the same experiments in humans because of ethical reasons, but different kinds of types of studies have shown that there are ep epigenetic tags that affect behavior uh, as a result of the interaction with the environment. And so we wanted to study, look at some genes to see association of genetic variants with trauma exposure 
and mental health and resilience, and to see if these associations change because of the intervention. And we chose to look at a gene called MAOA, uh, which is uh, expressed in males because it's X-linked, uh, and it has it's related to um, neuro. It breaks down neurotransmitters, including dopamine. So it has an impact on behavior. Uh, so what we did is we saw uh, among these children over a period of time how that there those who had low uh, expression of this protein MAOA uh, were had less uh, perception of stress compared to those who had high uh, activity of this gene. And then we correlated it with resilience. And we saw that those uh, males, children, who across time, who were exposed to a lot of trauma, that that perception of the trauma and the stress reduced not just for the high expression of this gene of MAOA, but also for those who had higher resilience. And this is like showing the, the interaction of three components, the stress, the genetic makeup, and the resilience that comes from uh, you know, community, family, uh, and, uh, pe and being positive. And this was published in PLOS One. Uh, and, and this is a call for more the, uh, kinds of this kind of research, which tries to understand the biology and the mechanisms behind how we deal with stress, looking at different factors, not just uh, self-reporting in mental health, but biomarkers and, and genetics. Uh, and again, this is the team that worked on this part of the research, looking at MAOA. But also, we had more questions. We know that some of these epigenetic tags as a result of the environment can be transferred across generations. Uh, and, and we know that although 99% uh, of genes, any epigenetic signature is erased, 1% persists and is transferred to the next generation. And the question was, what is that 1%? And can, is trauma or the signature of trauma persistent and remains and can be transferred within that 1% to the next generation? So for example, in this case, it's smoking, but we were looking at trauma of war. If a grandmother who was pregnant during trauma or war, uh, is that impact of the trauma on her own DNA or the DNA of her fetus or the DNA of the, of the eggs of the fetus inside her womb uh, are affected directly or indirectly through transmission? This is a very important question. We know it has been proven in mice, but nobody has really shown it in, 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 in humans uh, with a direct transfer of an epigenetic signature of trauma. Uh, and that's what we wanted to do. So we just recently got a grant from the National Science Foundation, and we have uh, three cohorts of families going from grandmother to mother to daughter, looking at um, where grandparents were exposed to trauma, parents were exposed to trauma, and children were exposed to trauma, to compare them to try to understand the um, uh, epigenetic signature of trauma and how it is transferred, if it is, across generations. So stay tuned for those results. And, and my daughter calls this the immortal kiss of our grandparents. And this is not to look at just the negative impact of trauma. Again, we always ask the negative because it's always sensational. We are here also focusing on the positive. How can this experience, which is happening all the time across millennia, uh, how does it boost on my resilience, right? How does it make me cope better with the surroundings uh, around me? So uh, to take advantage of that positive tone. Uh, so all our work was actually featured in a documentary, hence the name Terror and Hope, that was nom won a number of awards and was nominated uh, for uh, the uh, Academy Awards. And I urge you to look at it because it, it's one of the unique uh, movies that shows how science is delivering on its original goal of helping humanity uh, in a very uh, ethical way. And, and, and I just want to share, uh, as I conclude now, how a scientist in Jordan or the developing world, we can do good science, science that is published in, in peer-reviewed journals and in top-notch journals. Uh, and it's all about creating an environment inside the university and research institutions of feeling responsible and agency, of freedom of exchange of ideas, uh, and of having a will and that nothing is impossible. And I think today with COVID-19, we see that this is even the silver lining. I'm always the positive person is that we can, because now we have access through webinars and conferences online. Uh, we can interact with a lot more people. We can create collaborations. But more importantly, we're realizing in COVID-19 that the earth is flat. Every person counts in terms of contributing to science because uh, everybody wants to know how COVID is affecting everybody else. So everybody is unique. 
uh, as a woman, you are unique. As somebody coming from, your, uh, from the Arab world, you are unique. As a refugee, if you are, you are unique. And you have something special to contribute to society. So have confidence in yourself. And, and, try, and if somebody says you're just a drop in the ocean, you answer them and tell them, but what is the ocean? But millions of drops. Uh, so there you, uh, you have something that you can help solve. You have something you can help to contribute to. And that's what I did. It's not just also in your lab and in your classroom, think beyond. So even a scientist who do, does what I do, uh, uh, we notice other things. Again, seeing what everybody sees, but thinking when no one has thought. And so I developed the program, We Love Reading, to change mindsets through reading to create change makers. And this is very powerful, especially today with COVID-19 and vulnerable communities and displacement where there are no schools, there's not enough internet and technology. And it's all about an adult uh, reading aloud to children in their native tongue in an open space. Uh, you can take our training, it's in 10 languages, and, and you can be part of the Wheel of Reading movement that is spreading and has spread now to 61 countries around the world. And it recently won the UNHCR Nansen Refugee Award because of, as a good program, as a placeholder for education um, in, in times of displacement and, uh, and war. And to share more uh, of my story, I've written a book called Five Scarves Doing the Impossible, uh, this is an, it was reviewed in Nature, it's in English, and it's in Arabic, and I'll put the link in the chat. And, and I urge you to write your stories. My, the speaker before me, Salwa, talked about role models. We need more role models that look like us, that dress like us, that speak like us. And, and so you have to, none, this conference is showcasing these role models, but we also want everyone to write their story. Uh, are we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the future generation, so that they hear the story from our pen and pencil, and not from someone else. Uh, I'm going to share this last movie with you. The world needs us because we are scientists, teachers, artists. We are in all walks of life. We are also the daughters, the wives, the mothers, and above all, we are humans. Humans need to question and be questioned, to think, to share thoughts and emotions, to spread knowledge. We create networks to experience moments, a sense of togetherness and joy. Three Circles of Alamat exists because humans are determined to make it into this world. So, shall we start? So this is a mentoring program that we developed, and I invite you to be part of it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Rana, for this nice talk, as usual. I enjoyed it uh, very much, really. Please leave, uh, leave the link of your study uh, on chat because uh, Mr. Peter wants it, please. Absolutely, I'll, I'll put all the okay. links now in the chat. Okay, uh, from terror and hope, we will leave discussions at the end. <laughs> from terror and hope uh, to another nice lecture from India, from uh, Professor Anindad Bahadra. Professor Anindad Bahadra is a behavioral uh, biologist at the Department of Biological Sciences in Calcutta, she, found, uh, she founded the Dog Lab, uh, which is engaged, engaged in studying the behavior, ecology, uh, abilities of dogs. She is uh, particularly interested in understanding the evolution of the dog-human relationship. Dr. Bahadra is the recipient of uh, INSA Young Scientist Award uh, SERB Women Excellence Award and the IEB Young Scientist Award. She was involved in the founding of the Indian National Young Academy of Sciences. Uh, she, she is presently the co-chair of uh, Global Young Academy and in that uh, believes in the responsibility of a scientist in engaging with the society and is actively engaged in various science outreach activities. She is currently the Associate Dean of the International Relations and, that, and the Outreach Programs at her institute. 
uh, her lecture will be uh, about just another young girl with dreams to be different. You are different, Aninda. Go ahead for 15 minutes. Thank you, Amal. Uh, I will keep my video off because that helps the internet connectivity at times. So I thought Amal wanted me to talk about my journey. So I thought I'll give you a brief story of my life. Uh, the image on the slide is a representation because I uh, used to be a dancer at one point of time and I always uh, dreamed in color. So I thought this represented uh, me to some extent. It's a drawing I made a long time back. So when uh, I was a little girl, I uh, grew up in a big joint family with grandparents and uncles and my parents and I was the family's darling because I was the only kid in the house. And my family firmly believed in the importance of education and there was absolutely no running away because you were a girl. And I was sent off to a good school uh, with this dream that I would eventually become a doctor. My family didn't have a doctor and uh, everybody wanted me to grow up into a doctor. And uh, I heard it so many times since I was age three or something that it was ingrained in my head that I want to be a doctor too. Uh, I didn't have any uh, brothers and sisters for many years. I did a lot of uh, activities, both in school and uh, at home. I was dancing, I was doing theater, I was doing elocution. And often people thought I did more of everything and less of studies. Uh, my favorite pastime when I was alone at home was to teach. In fact, I started going to school at age five, but before I had seen a real teacher, I started teaching at age four the furniture in the house. And as I grew up and I, I had my sister and cousins and then their friends in the neighborhood, I became the neighborhood, uh, you know, big sister come teacher uh, to whom people will send their kids with their homework uh, or problems that they didn't understand. And I always had fun doing this. Sometimes I spent entire weekends just teaching kids. Um, in India, if you want to be a doctor after high school, you need to go, go for this common entrance test, which is called the joint entrance exam. And in those days, uh, there were very few seats for the medical entrance, which I flunked. And uh, this came as a big shock to my family and to me because that meant I cannot be a doctor, at least for one year. Uh, there was ostracization. I was confused what to do and the shock of failure for the first time in my life. You know, a lot of finger pointing. Eventually, I enrolled for a zoology course in college and I started enjoying it. And I had a couple of inspiring teachers to the extent that when I was asked to go and write the JE exam again, I doodled on the answer script because this time the paper seemed to be too easy. I was studying zoology. I knew all the answers and I did not want to go and get into medical anymore. I had a different dream coming up. Uh, this happened in my second year when we went for a field trip to this institute called the Indian Institute of Science, which is the best institute in the country, uh, led by a teacher uh, and uh, here, I got inspired and I started dreaming that I want to come here and become a different kind of doctor or PhD. Of course, during the graduation years in those days, there was no component of research. I had no idea what be becoming a PhD meant, but I wanted to do, do it. So after my graduation, I went ahead and did a post-graduation and I wrote the entrance test for the Institute and I got a call. And that was my dream come true. Still, I did not know what research meant. I went off to this fantastic institute uh, where I had a superb mentor, Professor Raghavendra Gadakkar, and I started working on the social wasp Ropleria marginata. I was also doing a lot of activities, including theater, and this is how I met the other half of my life, who happens to be my husband now. Uh, during my PhD, I was working, as I like to say, on the politics of this insect society. I tried to understand how a queen is made, how she maintains her rank, how when she dies, someone else becomes the queen. And in doing all of this, of course, I got a PhD, but I learned a lot. I learned from my seniors over endless cups of coffee and brainstorming sessions in the cafeteria. I learned while teaching interns and juniors. Uh, I learned from all the field experiments that I had during the first couple of years of my PhD. And I keep telling my students, if all your experiments succeed, you're not going to learn enough. You need to have failures in life. And then the thrill of success, the first publication, 
uh, and a lot of activities. I was uh, running in the students council. I was editing the student newsletter. I was doing a mental health uh, a support group for students. I was doing theater. I was doing a lot of things to the extent that during my thesis colloquium, friends asked me, when did you do all this work? You were always outside the lab doing other things. And in this process, I understood what the philosophy meant in the PhD. And I think that is the most important thing to learn during the course of a PhD. I submitted my thesis, and this is where a real big turn in my, real, in my life happened because my thesis was submitted on my son's first birthday. And again, when I was pregnant, the first person I went and told this to other than my husband was my PhD supervisor. And his response was, oh, wow, I'm going to be a grandfather. Unlike many PhD supervisors who would have thrown a fit. A lot of people told me, you can't do it. You can't have a baby and do your PhD. Or after your PhD, you cannot have a life uh, and successful career in science. And I said, I will. And this was proof. I continued to work as a postdoc for some time and I was undecided about the future. I didn't want to go away for a postdoc as the, as the norm that you have to go out of India to go to do a good postdoc, otherwise you don't get a job. But my priority was my family at that point of time. Again, Professor Gadakar came with sound advice. New set of institutions had started in India called the Indian Institutes of Science Education and Research. Only two had started and he said, they are taking in new faculty uh, as on contractual positions, fresh after their PhDs, why don't you try? And I started asking myself, am I ready to be an independent researcher? And this is when I was nominated and selected for the Insight Young Scientist Award, which is the most prestigious award for young scientists in the country. And this gave me more confidence. Uh, I had to now be independent. I had the opportunity to teach, which I absolutely loved. But then what about the family? Because my husband was working in the industry by that time. Uh, we both decided to shift. We made a choice. We chose Isaac Kolkata, up, applied there, and thankfully both of us got hired. Him in physics, me in biology, and we came. Before coming, I went with three competing proposals to my supervisor and said, tell me what I should work on. We had a brainstorming session, and eventually I settled on the stray dogs in India because they were interesting, because of the ease of access, because you find them everywhere, you don't need much money to do research on them, and the novelty because no one in the world was working on them. I came to ISER, initially it was great, we had great students, I loved the teaching experience, uh, I, there were a young cohort of faculty and we had a lot of camaraderie, we were involved in all the institute, institute building procedures because it's, it was a new institute. My research was progressing well. I got my independent grant in less than a year of joining the institute. And we all felt that we were part of history being made. But then within two years came failed promises because the director at that time expected certain things from me, which I was not ready to give. And uh, that I was also very outspoken. And this is what led to my, the starting of my struggle for survival, also at the time when I was expecting again. And then um, I continued to have a lot of dreams. I have written about this extensively and I'm not going to go about all the negative stories, but let me just tell you that as a woman, I was struggling much harder than anyone else. And I was struggling because I was a woman. And then towards the end of 2011, I gave birth to my daughter. I hardly even got my scheduled maternity leave because I was threatened I'll lose my contractual position if I took my full-term leave. I came back, I taught, I continued my research. Uh, the director changed, but my luck struggle continued from one contractual position. I was given a termination letter. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, feedback and then I was reinstated and I again got a contractual position. Meanwhile, I was realizing a dream of another kind. I was involved in uh, the founding of the International Young Academy of Science. This is the photograph from the first meeting we had as, as the founding members. I was elected the chair and uh, this was like really one other dream come true. And everybody told me, you are mad. You should be consolidating your position, applying for jobs elsewhere. Why are you doing this? This is a waste of time. Meanwhile, I got awards and recognitions elsewhere. I became a member of the Global Young Academy and none of these accolades were ever acknowledged by my institute. I realized that 
unlike my experience of my uh, you know student years an outspoken ambitious woman is a deadly combination at least in my country where the men sit in positions and they don't like women like me but i couldn't care less eventually uh, i became assistant professor uh, i did not have any service record for the six and a half years of service i'd given to the institute for all the papers grants students which i, I had uh, on. but i kept dreaming kept working and i couldn't give a damn i traveled the world presented my work met a lot of interesting people my first student graduated and only then uh, in 2019 i became an associate professor with a new director and then i was made associate dean and i got elected to the gy executive committee meanwhile i was constantly doing outreach and whenever i did these events in remote areas and schools and all kinds of places people told me why or not do you waste your time you know this will not pay this will not give you a publication stop it and I told them SDG four, that is what matters. And I was so happy to listen to the talks before me where everybody was talking about the importance of education, the importance of reaching out to the people who don't have it all. I got success. I got a lot of accolades. Our work got revealed. And in, in the two minutes, yes. two minutes. Last, last but one slide. In Science News and BBC, I got a lot of reviews in the newspaper and people said, Oh, but she doesn't even do science. That is why newspapers write about it. My students came crying and I said, keep working, don't bother, your papers will speak for you. The lessons I learned, the importance of asking questions is something I learned from a supervisor early in my PhD, the importance of treating people, every people with dignity, importance of mentorship, which I received from him, which I still receive from him, and I tried to give back to my students, the value of perseverance, and the satisfaction of leading a field of research rather than following the global north as most people in my country do. And I always like to quote Dickens saying, never say never. Don't give up. You persevere, you'll get results. And very recently, I got one of the most important awards for women scientists in the country, and I got a thrill putting my model system, the free ranging dogs in the certificate, which is apparently not even scientific research. All the people who matter, my family, students, my supervisor and his family, my GYA family, Enya's family, and all the friends in Isaac Kolkata who have stuck with me, stood by me in thick and thin and have believed in me. And because of all of them, I have been able to multitask, wear the multiple hats of a mother, a researcher, a theater performer, a GYA co-chair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'd like to stop here Thank you for your attention and thanks to Amal for the invitation. Thanks a lot, dear friend uh, Aninda, for your lecture and full uh, productive life story. Keep working, go ahead. We'll transfer to another inspiring lady and scientist, Dr. Iqbal, uh, now from Norway. She is from Yemen originally. Uh, Dr. Iqbal received her PhD in biochemistry from, uh, from Malaysia sponsored by Organization for Women, for Women in Science for the Developing country, Countries, uh, OST. Her main research interest is in biochemistry, food, uh, antioxidants, and nutrition. Um, Dr. Iqbal, she is the president of Yemeni Association for Science and Technology for Development, OST national, national chapter in Taz City. She was selected as one of five winners of the 2014 Elsevier Foundation Award for Early Career Women Scientists in the Developing Countries, Chemical Sciences. After the war in Yemen, Iqbal was selected to be a visiting scholar in Malaysia. Then uh, she was appointed as an associate professor at University of Adgar in Norway. In September 2018, she had been selected as TWAS Young Athlete for 2018-2022. In May 2019, she was selected as member of Global Young Academy for five years. She has big CV, but I will leave the floor for her to explain and to tell us her story. The floor is yours for 15 minutes. Thank you so much. I know Amal. that you will exceed the time, but only one minute or two minutes, okay? It's okay. Thank you so much, Prof. Okay. Amal. I don't know if Thanks you so are much. seeing my slides now. Yes, yes, I see yeah. slides. 
Okay, so thank you so much for inviting me to contribute in this wonderful event. So uh, I will talk today about my experience with life and working in a new social, culture and academic environment. So I'm working now in the uh, University of Oslo in Norway. Um, yeah, I'm from Yemen, as you said, Amal. Um, the capital city of Yemen is Sana'a. I'm coming from a beautiful city called Taiz in this red place. Uh, Yemen now is facing very difficult uh, situation with the war, but uh, I just read now comment from Ibrahim, and he is from Yemen, that yes, we have Corona in Yemen, but uh, the war is stronger than Corona. So uh, we hope just to let us hope that uh, the war will end soon, inshallah. So this is just uh, brief about my background. I received uh, my bachelor in biological chemistry field, and then I received my master in organic chemistry field. But here in this period of the master, I faced a lot of challenges. Um, it was difficult for me to complete my master. Um, uh, like um, uh, I, I had a lack of equipment, lack of uh, chemicals, and you know that we should buy everything by ourselves. So wait long time to um, receive uh, the chemicals coming from outside of Yemen. And after I got some uh, result, I should send my result uh, to the Egypt to do some analysis. And then uh, it takes long time for me and before my um, defense my supervisor died. So it was uh, really difficult for me to receive uh, the master for five years. I was hoped that's time to uh, continue my uh, uh, education in outside of Yemen and I was lucky that I received scholarship from OST organization in Italy to complete my uh, PhD in Malaysia, University Kamiksa in Malaysia. And it was first time for me to go out from Yemen. Um, I was really um, like uh, the first time to be away from your family, away from friend, colleagues. So, but I was lucky that um, I was surrounded by very good people around me. I received my PhD with excellent thesis. And this is during the ceremony with um, I received my certificate from the king of the region. And then after, because of this uh, uh, award, uh, I received uh, one year as a postdoc uh, at the same university. It was really um, beautiful year for me uh, to be just uh, learn more about how can I be supervisor? How can I write a paper? And I did uh, some publications, books, and um, uh, journal um, papers, as you say now. And I was also the supervisor for some bachelor students. Then I back to Yemen in July 2013. And this, when I receive or and when I arrive Yemen from the, uh, you can see this photo. I really love this photo. It's a crowded um, photos in this slide, but uh, it makes me really so happy that from the first week I arrive Yemen. This is the most important positive thing that I receive a position as a lecturer, senior lecturer in Assad University. And then after two months, I receive award, a uh, civil foundation award in science uh, in chemical sciences. And then when I came from Malaysia, I bring with me dream to open anything about nutrition because I was really curious to, to um, make all the Yemenis people know more uh, about the nutrition and take care of um, themselves uh, or take care about their food. So I was uh, really lucky to open or manage to open this uh, department program um, about the therapeutic nutrition, uh, therapeutic nutrition department, and it was like the first department that time in my city. And this is the um, first exhibition, nutrition exhibi exhibition in my uh, city, uh, Taez. And you can see this is my uh, students' products. Uh, it was natural without any chemicals. I was so happy that time, but unfortunately it was the last academic activity I have done um, that time before the war. 26 March, 2015, everything I have done before become done, gone, 
because of the war. I had this date because I lost many things in my life. I lost some members from my family, colleagues, friends, our own home bombed, students killed, some of them. So it was terrible and bad, difficult time for me. Uh, I just sat at home, not in our own home because it already bombed. We ran away to another place. I cannot say safe, but safer than our area. It was difficult time to stay just without anything. All the time you are stressed, afraid, no electricity, no internet, no salary, no petrol. Uh, the bombed surrounding of me. So it was a really difficult uh, time. I tried all my best to do anything to go out from Yemen and continue my academic career. I was happy that I have contact person or mentor, or I have former post. And this is the most important things that I will talk about that contact person or mentor is very important to help support advice guidelines a sense and give more information so i was lucky that professor amina abdullah she was my former boss or supervisor in malaysia and she was so uh, helpful and she tried to help me to submit my documents to um, organization it was difficult for me to submit my documents because no internet no electricity how can i do uh, how can I upload my document? So she did that for me because sometimes if I want to contact with her, just charge my mobile in the car. But, but at the same time, I was so afraid because I should keep the petrol in my car if we want to, uh, if we want to run away again from that area. So I was lucky that uh, Laura, she was my contact person in, uh, from uh, School of Rescue Fund in America. And she, she was really very helpful also. And uh, she sent me back. And I, can, I was uh, really so lucky to go out from Yemen before the Sana airport closed. And then uh, after I spent two years in Malaysia, I don't know what can I do, Laura. She also helped me. To, uh, or give me a link to contact with another organizations. And Sharia, she is, she was and she is still my contact person from SAR organization in America also. And she was also very nice with me from the beginning and she helped me to send my uh, documents to um, uh, universities, different universities in Europe. And I was lucky that I received good news that University of Agdar in um, Norway accepting me as associate professor in University of Agdar. And I was lucky to have these wonderful people. Uh, Kari Lisa, she was my contact person and both of them administration and academic contact persons with me. And then I spent two years in University of Agdar. After that, I have to looking for another opportunity to continue my academic journey because any organizations they are helping just for two years. Uh, and of course, University of Agdar uh, understand well my uh, situation and they helped me to find another opportunity um, to work or continue my academic journey in University of Oslo. And now working with the University of Oslo and Professor Rona, he is my contact person now. Uh, when I was, or I spent two years in Malaysia, it was easy for me to just start my academic journey and I was so happy to, okay, I will back again to my academic activity because I'm familiar with everything in Malaysia. So I didn't face any challenges in Malaysia because I was there before. But when I received Norway, or when I arrived in Norway, first of all, I spent two years in University of Agdar. It was difficult for me to start my academic work because big difference between Malaysia or Yemen and Europe countries, especially Scandinavia, one of the Scandinavia countries. So big difference, uh, I, can, so I can see different with culture, religion, weather, language. So it's not easy at all to start uh, the work. So I faced really a lot of challenges, but the solution was an advice from different my uh, academic uh, persons around me and mentor that just keep 
in your um, network work uh, network so i just keep um, contacting with my people around the world and start my academic and it was this is the outcome of my uh, network just attending different um, or several uh, events around the world of course before covid 19 and uh, the most important choices and opportunity in my career development during my time in the host universities as i said contact person and this is very important for me to uh, understand well the academic culture and work environment and also i was very lucky to surrounded by amazing people and it's very good for adaptation and integration uh, integration and at the same time I attend very very helpful course working with Norwegian uh, people it's very very um, good for anyone coming to Norway and at the same time I receive very good support to um, uh, learn Norwegian uh, language and still I'm um, study um, this um, language so because I did or I worked hard on myself <laughs> I start to receive uh, invitation to be um, among very wonderful researcher and uh, scientists in the center of research um, research center and at the same time teaching in the University of Agder in different departments give my public talk in the university and outside the university and the end of 2018 I um, they selected me as the best uh, employee in the university and in the end of 2019 i was uh, happy to select me in this uh, very good um, award as um, cross culture bridge uh, builder for 2019 of course uh, i was sometime under stress but to go out from this bad circle we are away from our family so we are thinking a lot about many things so this is my advice for all the people refugee or square atlas refugee scientists to just try to win friend in your host country or host institutes so this is the outcome to 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 win friends so they will understand more about the culture environment or work environment language and they will help you to celebrate with you even your religion uh, events, as you see here, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha. So then I moved to Oslo University, and because of COVID-19, we just working online. And it it is really nice that not just sitting without anything. At last, at least we are doing something online. So from my experience. I would like just to um, give some advices that flexibility and adaptation are the keys to working in the multicultural environment, develop understanding for different culture and uh, values and respect those difference. When friend, learn to listen well and give other the confidence to be able to communicate with you by showing respect. Thank you for your attention. Well, yeah. thanks a lot for touching lecture. Really, with your positive spirit, really, you give me always hope for the future. When I look to you and your colors, your positive vibes, you are fantastic, really. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll, thanks a lot. I leave the floor now for Professor Anindad for discussions and questions. Thank you. Anindad. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know what to say, Iqbal. I mean, I've heard your story before, and every time I hear it, it gives me goosebumps. The struggle that you've gone through and the way you've survived, I think that is the most important message here. You know, you are a survivor. Congratulations and uh, keep shining. Thank you so, so much. So, please go back. By the way, Aninda, your background is fantastic. Uh, I borrowed it from the United Nations website. <laughs> so um, we uh, have a few questions uh, in the chat box. And if anyone else would like to type in questions for the panelists, please do so now. Uh, I will uh, try to take uh, the questions as they come. 
Uh, so for questions and comments. So there is one comment from uh, Peter. Uh, this is uh, very nice. He says that COVID RNA vaccine exists because of the work of Jennifer Ann Dudna, who's a biochemist known for her pioneering work in CRISPR gene editing, for which she was awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry along with Emmanuel Charpentier. And that's definitely a celebration of women that we really need to you know, remember and uh, keep reminding our students, I guess. And uh, you know, these are the role models that uh, we need to have uh, before us for our girls to look up to. Um, so uh, fantastic. Um, there's a question here, just a minute. So, um, People are saying awesome, brilliant. Uh, there's a link to the female mentoring program, which has been put in the chat, chat box. Please uh, go up and look at it. Um, uh, Professor Rana has shared all her links. Um, so here's a question from Iman Muhammad. Uh, I graduated in 2019 from the Faculty of Science, South Valley University in Upper Egypt. I was not able to be a teaching assistant at the university. I want to continue in the field of scientific research, but I do not know the way for that. Please give me advice. So uh, let me give this to uh, Salva and uh, then uh, perhaps to Iqbal to answer this question. Yes, thank you. Um, so I was actually when I saw that, um, that that question, I really thought about when I first started in in, in journalism, and um, I couldn't get a job at uh, you know at the UN and not 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 any media outlet at the beginning, and I just started to be honest as as an intern. Um, so my my advice for you is, um, do not give up. Um, your time will come to get that assistant job, but if I can give a suggestion, the first thing that came to mind was, why don't you have a group of people and start teaching, you know, do the thing that you love, uh, volunteer, do volunteer work. Um, don't leave this space until you find the job that you deserve. Don't leave it empty. Do something that is related to your field. Um, inspire other girls to continue their education in, in different fields. Uh, teach them, pass your knowledge. Uh, that would be my advice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Iqbal, you want to add something? Yeah, I think Salwa, she said the perfect things that never give up, just keep going, try to find um, uh, a right place in the internet to looking for any opportunity to continue your uh, journey. And the first thing, don't give up, just be positive. Yes, absolutely. I think that is one message that we need to give out. I would actually also like to add that given that we are going, we have gone virtual, one way to kind of um, brush up your teaching skills and reach out to people is you could start a teaching channel on YouTube. You know, uh, put up small uh, lectures, lessons on things that you like and uh, set it out for your target audience. That time, at times that helps a lot of people who are looking for material and it helps you to brush up your skills always. Mm, there is uh, Ibrahim al Hijri, and uh, she's saying that I am uh, in the beginning of this difficult journey and uh, she has four children. So we wish you more power and uh, we hope that you are going to be successful in your journey. Uh, yes, Amal, you want time? You want to speak? It's not me. It's the okay. moderator, the IT moderator, oh, the moderator, Dr. Shaheen or Dr. Ahmed. Okay, this is Dr. Ahmed Al Khalil from, okay, the, universe, from the University of Duhok. I would like uh, to thank you all for your nice um, uh, talk and presentation. Um, right. Um, I hope that I will not take more than a couple of minutes. Um, so. Um, I hold a dual nationality, um, um, an Iraqi and British nationality, and I used to live in both, I mean, in Iraq and the UK, but uh, actually I was brought up in Iraq. So, in my opinion, um, the uh, um, most problem that faced by the people 
or the people um, struggling from um, 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 a specific problem of um, um, uh, stability, okay? In our area, I mean, in the, in the, in the Middle East especially, uh, the people here are facing the problems of wars, okay? So uh, probably some uh, economic problems as well. So basically, this area is unstable, yeah? So if we got uh, like, uh, I mean, um, um, st stable environment, not only the women can show their uh, um, innovation, but also the, the, the men. So the main thing is the country should be stable. And one of the good example is a pro uh, Iqbal. Pro Iqbal has the ability, okay? And she has showed that ability when she moved where? When she moved to the uh, 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 Europe, okay? So this is my comment. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your comment. So if people have more questions for the speakers, please uh, type them in the chat box and I'm going to take them up. Uh, meanwhile, I have a few more questions here. So uh, I was really, really impressed by uh, Salva, the program that you spoke about. And, uh, you know, this idea that girls and women are not even aware of uh, their rights and their entitlement. This is something that is very true across countries. I know in India, I see this all the time that uh, Girls accept when the family says that your brother needs to study and we can only afford to send one person to school and we will send the brother to school and marry you off. Or, you know, you don't need to study beyond the school, which is free. Beyond that, higher education is not free and you don't need to do this, you're a girl. Maybe she's the brighter of the two kids, but the boy gets to go for higher, higher education to college, the girl does not. And they accept it, saying, yes, I'm a girl. This is acceptable. This is the norm of society. So, you know, I really think that we need to educate our girls and our women to really speak up for their rights. And Amal, this brings, uh, the, this, you know, brought back memories of uh, the conference in Egypt last to last time when we had a fantastic speaker who was doing research on domestic violence. And uh, she was showing a lot of examples how, of how women accept this because this is the norm. And you know, she was showing such vivid images that they have remained with me. So uh, I would like uh, the panelists to you know, comment on this. And I can see that Salva has already raised her hand. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, but what I wanted to, to add to what you were just saying is that the education should not just be for women and girls because we can educate women and girls for years, we, they can be so aware of their rights. However, if boys and men in our societies, in, in this male dominant uh, culture are not aware, do not accept women, you will have then honor killings, you will have, uh, you will have uh, harassment, you'll be putting the woman in more danger. So that's why with the, with the UN, especially now, we're, we're following what we call, uh, you know, men engage, you know, we are involving men and boys more in these discussions, we are explaining that the civil society is also doing a phenomenal work in, in Iraq. Men need to have, uh, you know, more information about women's rights, they need to be, and, and unfortunately, I say it with like a little bit of a broken heart, they need to be convinced, uh, especially I would say here that, you know, women are equals because a lot of men are not really convinced uh, and, and we need to, to show um, we are born in this uh, non-equal world and I always say uh, we can always talk about what's going wrong, but we need to find whatever solution, whatever mean possible to make it right. Um, and I think the more we engage men, the more we, we tackle young boys or boys at a very young age, uh, the more successful we are in, in achieving uh, gender equality. Um, for example, um, as UNFPA, we have, um, we have this, this group that we support. It's called the Youth Peer Network. And they have young people uh, as young as uh, 12 or 13 years old, men and girls, you know, sorry, boys, boys and, uh, and girls. And, uh, you know, they discuss, they discuss rights, they discuss different opinions, they debate. And it's always a pleasure to go attend their sessions because you can hear the different opinions. They, they, one time someone asked me, what's the difference between, you know, getting married at the age of 15 or at the age of 18? And, and they were talking with one another and the girls were defending and the boys were, 
where a lot of boys were, were understanding and they've changed their positions. And, and that's, that's hope for us because um, I know we always say young people are the future generation, but they are. Um, so it's, it's such a positive thing to invest in, 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 in young people and especially, you know, boys, not only girls uh, in, such, in, in our board today. Thank you. Thank you, Salva. Anyone of the other panelists would like to comment on that? Rana? I'm mute. Uh, I want to reiterate what Salwa said and add uh, to have uh, more uh, engagement and, and voices and to write the story. So it doesn't have to be uh, the story of, of success. To write our, our different stages of our lives, where we are, so that people can relate that maybe I will not be able to achieve, for example, what Professor Akbar did, right? I, I, I stayed in my own country and how things worked. Or, so to, to share more stories of reality uh, so that people don't feel they're alone, that there's, there's others with them, and then they can work together to find solutions together. Again, this teamwork, this South-South, uh, Iqbal had to go to Norway in Oslo, right? Uh, Malaysia is a great South-South, but also, again, among the Arab worlds, because eventually every one of us, wherever we are, in the future, we may become administrators, deans, and so we may have some leverage to, to introduce this kind of collaboration and working together. Just to add, to add small comment, yes, to, please uh, go ahead. Prof Rana, it's not by my hand to go out, out of my country. It's because oh. of the war. So, no, no, uh, that's if, what I meant. That's yeah, what I, I know. But for me, I, I would like to just stay with my family in my oh. country. So I didn't visit my my family since six years ago. So it's it's hard and difficult for us also. So I hope to just do my work with my uh, people in my country, but it's out of my hand. I meant, you know, why don't we in Jordan take you in? I don't yeah. mean about, you know what I mean? Like you had to go to Oslo for some, why didn't somebody from Jordan take you in? Why didn't somebody yeah. from uh, Morocco? That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. you, you, you do not control what happened to you, like people in Yemen and Iraq and Syria. And my question is, let's do more South-South where we can help you. And, it's, and, and to think about how to do that. That was my point. Not about why you left your country at all. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, that's what I meant. Okay. It's, the same, uh, it's the same point of this conference because we are the first of its kind for refugees. It's from the Arab uh, area. That uh, what Rana meant. Why not the solution came from us at first and then ask the help from the others? Exactly, that's what I meant, right? Just for us who are comfortable to step up and do. Sometimes we can't do it either. We want to, but we can't because of bureaucracy and, and other things. And this is what I'm saying. L let's try to use, if we in, are in a position where we have authority or agency, to, to step up and say, hey, we want to do a, a program for scholars uh, like you, Iqbal. Uh, and I just want, for the sake of uh, giving uh, credit, I know Jordan has taken in a lot of Iraqi professors. And, and, and uh, in, in my university, in Hashemite University, we have many Iraqi professors. Uh, and we've taken in, uh, I think, a few Yemeni as well. So, so, but we need more. We need more. We're doing it, but we need more. Uh, I mean that I want to comment. I have a comment on uh, what you said. Uh, sometimes the cultural uh, differences also play a role in uh, accepting uh, what happens for uh, the women. You understand? Uh, I have a story. My uh, daughter wanted to make a survey on sexual diseases. Uh, she tried to uh, take the opinion of the students inside her faculty. Uh, she is studying medicine, okay? Several people refuse to give her uh, uh, the opinion. You understand? Maybe because they are ashamed to talk in this matter, even they are doctors. You understand? And sometimes uh, they don't like to talk in this matter. And when she wanted uh, to make a bigger survey inside the, the university or inside the relatives and so on, she met refusal. You understand? It's, sometimes it's a cultural matter. And we have uh, to push these cultural matters, we, ourselves. You understand, sometimes we lost our uh, rights by ourselves. Like uh, someone speaker told that we have to ask for our rights. We uh, don't have to wait uh, that someone give us our rights. You understand? 
Thanks. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Peter, please go ahead. Um, coming from the free Commonwealth of Massachusetts in, in the United States, I'm all about uh, struggling for uh, your rights. And, and uh, to all the participants, in particular, our uh, uh, female participants who, who face so many barriers that I think men appreciate but don't necessarily understand intuitively because these are not barriers that, that we face. Uh, although there may be uh, there may be others, but struggle, struggle. To the colleague that asked, you know, what do I do? I, I have this teaching ability, but I can't find a job. Um, apply, apply, apply. Don't don't believe that rejection because you've applied for a particular position uh, or a particular program is a reflection on you. My goodness, I mean, when I started practicing law. I, I think I probably wrote to 500 law firms, 499 of which rejected me, but apply, <laughs> <laughs> apply, apply. Um, I really want to, uh, to uh, underscore a, a comment that Rana made, uh, and if I could recharacterize it a bit, about the, the impact of colonialism uh, on borders and therefore on refugee definition and therefore on perceptions. And I think the point that you make about these artificial borders not recognizing that a, a family is in Syria and in Iraq, in Kurdistan at the same time, uh, is crucially important, uh, particularly in the context of the global compact uh, for refugees, which is now really looking uh, uh, not at artificial definitions, uh, but at displaced populations and how they can be supported in situ uh, uh, in countries of asylum. And I think in particular in the Middle East and in parts of, of Southeast Asia, I, there is such a capacity uh, to include uh, refugees uh, in academic programs, in, uh, uh, in employment opportunities. And, and, you know, many countries in the Middle East really make an effort uh, to uh, uh, to do that, and I, I think that 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 kind of moving away, uh, whether it's you know part of a colonial critique or otherwise, moving away from the notion that oh refugees are people who should be in camps, refugees are people who should be given assistance. Uh, UNHCR has gone through a learning process uh, over the years, and and now if I can summarize our policy with respect to camps, it is that camps are bad. They're not normal places for people. They, they, they break apart relationships. They separate uh, populations. And so much of the goal uh, of, of the Global Compact on Refugees uh, is, is really to work with both public sector, private sector uh, on inclusion. Uh, while people are in displacement. And then you may not have, I mean, I, I'm so happy for the opportunities that colleagues have had in other countries, but I'm mindful also of the brain drain that happens in the context of, of conflict and, and all that talent and energy going to other countries and being lost uh, in, in, in countries of origin that people have had to flee uh, and, and their ability to uh, support the rebuilding of, of those countries. So maybe it all boils down to think globally, act locally, uh, but uh, uh, by all means, and especially for our women and colleagues, by all means, act and don't give a damn. That's right. Don't give a damn. <laughs> well, there is a comment, uh, Mr. Beter, that uh, in the morning we had a lecture about colonization of science. Now, if uh, somebody, as example from Yemen, ask it to have help for his or her university from abroad, from US or something like that. They prefer to uh, get this scholar at their university, not to vice versa, to not to help him build something at his country. This is something wrong. And uh, that conference is an opportunity also to yes. give this message. Why not to build on land? Not always the solution. Why always the solution? to get scholarship for these uh, scholars at risk outside. Why yes. not to help them build the universities, build their country again? Yes. That's the yes. message of this uh, forum or other forums, fora. Why not to help them rebuild? Yes, and I, that's exactly correct, Professor. And I think, you know, creating, uh, and, and that's why education and displacement is so important because 
God willing, those skills can be brought back to the countries that people have come from. Because, yes. you know, I know there's a lot of garbage about, oh, how refugees only want to go to foreign countries and blah, blah, blah. And it's tied up into all of this nationalism. People love home. It doesn't yes. matter where home is and all the problems that home has. People love home. Uh, but uh, of course, but you need more... rescheduling. You need rescheduling for priorities. As example, UN will give them food and water and camps and science. Yeah. We have to add <laughs> these four priorities. Not Absolutely. only food and water and uh, camps yeah. and Absolutely. science and Absolutely. rebuilding. Absolutely. You in UN, you have to put it in your recommendations. Really, we do. We, we try. <laughs> We also struggle. Yeah. <laughs> Science, technology, and the innovation must be from priorities. Yes, indeed. Thanks. If Bonnie wants to comment on that. Yeah, it's just a short comment. Uh, or I would like to uh, let you know that not all the scholar at risk and um, the refugee scientists outside their countries, they are happy with their position or work because when you see that you are sexist in your work and you feel oh, why I'm not doing that in my country with my people, it's, it's really difficult feelings. But at the same time, um, there is very important points. We need to uh, let all the organizations and foundations that, who they are helping these people that um, they are um, in very sensitive situation and they need help in different way, not like any people in their country. For example, if I'm associate professor, but when they uh, are introduced me to another people, they said scholar at risk. Um, we have scholar at risk. Okay, so I, I, I study all my uh, age to reach to this point, then I'm scholar at risk. Yes, I'm scholar at risk or refugee scientist, but I'm in my um, uh, workplace. So, I tried some time, yeah, so I'm trying some time in different meetings or mm. webinar or workshop to, to put this point that, and this is just one of many things we are really feel that why they are doing that with us. We are doing very good and they are happy with us. So, but still we have something we need to treat it uh, or inform them that please fix this point. Please fix this point. Yeah. I think that's a very, very important point that Iqbal has mentioned, you know, that again brings me back to Rana's point on otherization, like you said, you know, you make the refugees the others by calling them or giving them this label of a refugee, the, your relatives, your friends from another country become the others. Similarly, you know, you are an associate professor in your university, but then uh, in a context, you become the other, and this is this otherization is something we have to get rid of. We cannot otherize people. Uh, I have a question here uh, from uh, Robert of uh, GYA. He's asking this to all panelists, um, and you can go and type your answers in the Q and A if you like. He says, "Question to the fantastic and inspiring speakers: Which science organizations do you know that foster gender equality best, and how do they do this?" Can you give examples from your experience from your own institutions? Who would like to answer that question? I, I, I don't think anyone has a, an answer. <laughs> I think it's more about the, it's about change. Everything needs to be improved. <laughs> so uh, we can learn uh, maybe different things here and there. Uh, there's a mentoring program here. Somebody's done a quota to make sure there's a 50% uh, you know, quota of women here. But I don't think any institution can claim that. And uh, although we know that there are some uh, efforts to create awards for organizations who've kind of aspired to a certain standard, uh, but we need more of that. So I think rather than saying which institution is doing better, uh, asking ourselves what are the paths or methods or uh, processes that we can put in place to encourage these institutions uh, that in research to do better. And one suggestion, which I learned from another group of people working on social entrepreneurship when I wear my other hat, which is the Wheel of Reading hat, is <clears throat> to create awards that, uh, and it's not about monetary award, it's credibility, uh, to, uh, to celebrate organizations or institutions 
who uh, display a, a higher standard of uh, equity, liberation, and equality. And, and then, so that way you, people aspire to get the award, and so they start fixing uh, themselves from the inside to get the award. So you kind of raise the bar and the standard. So this is a shout out to create such uh, types of award for particular goals uh, with particular standards. Uh, actually, in India, we have a National Institute's ranking framework, which the government of the country has started for the last few years. And there, one of the criteria on which you are graded is uh, gender equality in terms of uh, students and in terms of uh, women faculty being in administrative positions. And now institutions are waking up to the fact that you need women administrators and, you know, you can get brownie points for that in this ranking framework. And there are more and more women who are being put in these positions who would have been there by their own merit, but were not even considered at one point of time. So yeah, it's a similar system, I guess. I but have comments. Uh, I have yes, comments. Go ahead. Uh, uh, from my experience in this case, I, uh, I gained that the organization still now, even uh, which specialized in women uh, affairs, uh, do not understand what is uh, gender equality. They all always uh, understand gender equality that put women everywhere. No, I don't accept to be uh, in a position not fit to me, you understand? I prefer justice, uh, equal opportunities, uh, practicing, uh, training, and so on. So gender equality, not well understandable with respect to organizations or countries. We need to be like each one. As you said, no others. We don't need to, to put always in the others. Empowerment, I need to cancel empowerment. <laughs> empowerment is totally bad. That's, that's exactly just, what you started off with, Amal, that you don't like the idea of a Women's Day. But yeah. and just like Peter said, the day we don't need to have a Women's Day, we will know that we have attained equality. Right? We so are we all the same, yes, we are all the same. Yes, that's why absolutely. I said gender equality not understandable till now. You know, something that I always find very irritating that somebody says, you know, uh, we want to invite you to the panel and then you realize you've been invited because they need a woman on the panel, not <laughs> you on the panel. Right. And then I always have this question, should I say yes or no? But then I always feel like if I say no, finally this is going to be an all-male panel anyway and there's going to be nobody yes. speaking up for the women. So often I accept just because of that. Because, you know, somebody has to go and speak for the women too and say that this is not right. Even, uh, you know, that, uh, that sometimes they consider us as minority. I heard from one organization, international organization, that they need one woman in hijab so that they started to choose some women in hijab. It's, it's very bad. It's very bad. We have, uh, yeah, we have to reject that. We haven't uh, to accept that. Really, we have to refuse that at all. No women, no women's day, no empowerment. We are the same, all the same. It's, it's the same in the context of race. Uh, it's the same in the context of uh, religious division uh, and that sort of thing. But, and I, we all aspire for that day, but it takes work to get there. Uh, it takes work and it takes struggle. Uh, and uh, I think events like this are uh, crucially important in, in uh, uh, supporting and, and furthering uh, that work. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Amal, can shall we wrap up on that positive note about the event which is going to lead to better empowerment? Because I think we are running out of time. We need um, photo. Uh, Just uh, open your cameras, please. Open your cameras. All the speakers, open your cameras. Um, Sorry, Prof. Prof. Iqbal was uh, raising her hand for a while. Really? Iqbal. That's okay. <laughs> Iqbal. Iqbal. <laughs> it's okay. Speak it's just loud. short. It's just short um, comment uh, on my previous comment that uh, when I was or when I moved from Malaysia to Norway, I was really afraid that how can I live there because a big difference with language, religion, uh, everything. So how can I meet the people there? How can I work with them? But I was surprised that 
they meet me or they welcome me very well. They, uh, they were like my family here in Norway. They supporting me a lot. Uh, in my personal life and my work. So just to change the thought or negative thing I said about the scholar or at risk or another thing. So they are here very, very kind. And I did very good work in Christian Science City in um, Agder University. And now I'm working with very good project uh, in the nutrition department in Oslo University with very good people. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Can we take photo? Just to open Thanks. cameras because we have uh, more to technical sessions. Thanks a lot for all nice speakers. Thanks for accepting my invitation. And we may meet again because all of us support No Women's Day. <laughs> Open cameras. Dr. Ahmed, have you finished? I just need to take one more, one more photo, please. Okay. Yes, all done. Thank you so much for everyone. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. See you later. We have two more technical sessions. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Good day. 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 Good day.